Hey leaders, you're going to want to tune in for this episode as Curtis and Lorna have invited Carmen Semenyuk to join us for a conversation around her experience of implementing collaborative response. And I have to tell you, the ideas that come from this demonstration of leadership, right down to how you solicit feedback from your staff and reflect on your process as a result, how you leverage teaching colleagues in order to advocate for a process. These are some key ideas you're going to want to tune in for. Putting the pieces together with Jigsaw Learning focuses on stories from the field as leaders implement collaborative response. Join us every month as we invite our partners to share how they are meeting the diverse needs of students with the integral understanding that every child deserves a team. Welcome back to Putting the Pieces Together with Jigsaw Learning. Curtis and Lorna have introduced me to Carmen Semenyak, who has spent the last 15 years in, as an educator and five of those as an administrator. And she is currently the principal of the Light of Christ Catholic School with Lakeland Catholic School District. So hi, Carmen. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. And hi, hi Carmen. Hi, Carmen. Great to see you this morning. <laughs> So before I dig into the details about how you came to meet Curtis and Lorna, can you give me a little bit of background about your school? How many students do you have? How many staff? Where are you located? Perfect. We are located in Lacobiche, Alberta. We are a fairly new school. Uh, we opened just six, seven years ago. We started as a K-7 school and have added a grade ever since. So we're currently a K-12. We offer both English programming and French immersion. We offer preschool and daycare um, and out-of-school care. So we kind of have a whole gamut of programs that we offer within our building. Uh, we have 250 students within those grades, uh, primarily focused in the K-9 grade levels and then a few students in high school. That's a, a, a lot of programming happening in one yeah, building. Is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, that you've continued to add on, like it just continues to grow. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I know that Curtis and Lorna have introduced you to me today, but how did you come to know Curtis and Lorna? I believe it was the first COVID year where our school district said, hey, we're jumping on board with Jigsaw Learning with the uh, collaborative response model. And so administrators started that year. And then the following year, we had a leadership team within our school who that engaged with the collaborative response model. And then we brought it on our whole staff this the following year. So this will be our second year as a whole staff. So I'm always interested, Carmen, when you talk about getting introduced uh, to the work, Lorna's going to ask a question in a bit about, you know, what resonated or attracted you to some of the conversations, but would love to know what were your first takes or your first uh, reactions when being shared this collaborative response framework for <laughs> your school, and actually it was all schools across the division at the time. It was a little bit two-sided, a little bit, well, we are having student meetings and then a little bit, oh, I don't think this is what we're doing. <laughs> so <laughs> it was the opportunity to take a look at what are we doing? How is it different? Why is this approach better and more focused in helping students? And once we saw that difference, it was absolutely we're on board. Ella, and I can remember those first conversations around, well, don't we already do this? But I think that was one of the exciting things about beginning work with Lakeland is so many of the structures and groundwork were already laid that it wasn't um, cataclysmic shift to begin engaging in this work as well. Absolutely. Exactly. It was how do we put in the important parts, right? Yeah. We can say this is the same, and not get any different results. Yeah. How do we say these parts are critical and this is what needs to be implemented to have a shift in our outcome? 
Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And we we often have, especially just starting out, we often have people say, well, you know, we meet, we're meeting all the time. Yeah, we talk about kids and, all the time yeah, in our building, which is not a shock. For kids all the time, but it's that intent, those intentional pieces and the intentional mm -hmm. connections that are really important. But Carmen, what is it uh, about collaborative response that really stuck with you in terms of being a school leader? It is that evidence-based, what is the data saying? Um, we noticed previously that even the conversations we were having about students were the students that are taking the most of our time. Yeah, of course. So how do we take a look at the data and also catch those students where we can implement sometimes minimal, sometimes medium supports, um, but how can we ensure that we are having conversations that make make a difference at the end for mm -hmm. all students and not just focusing on those that are taking up the majority of the time? Well, we often talk within collaborative response that it really is about instilling that upstream thinking uh, mindset within a school of how can we be proactive? How can we be looking at our entire student population and be responding to the needs of students, of mm -hmm. course, but doing it in a way that's building everybody's capacity so that in time we're needing less and less of the more intensive conversations and the ones that we're having are the students that absolutely need to have that conversation in place rather than the reactive, oh no, this is blown up and how do we respond? Absolutely. And to bring it one step further in the conversations that we are having, how are we having the conversations on the key issues so that the conversation we're having, taking the time to have is focusing on the highest number of students at one time rather than one student. My experience as an administrator, yours as well, is doing it one student at a time. Even when you only have 250 in the building, it's still exhausting. It can feel like you're spinning um, just in react mode consistently. Absolutely. That's exactly it. We, we always say that, you know, this work doesn't go anywhere without a leader who is moving things forward, but mm. you have an amazing team, <laughs> an amazing leadership team that just right from the very beginning, you were on the same page and tell me a little bit about how that has helped you. That was the amazing part, honestly. We started with just myself and my vice principal. And then the second year when we created our team, we wanted to make sure we included our classroom support teacher, uh, that we included two teachers, one from the lower elementary, one for that middle school age, so that we could also get perspective, right? Where we may be dealing with some of the same issues or we may be dealing with some completely different key issues. But how do we ensure that the the model we're using supports all students and isn't tailored or focused on one. And so when we built that team, we we approached our teachers and said, hey, this is what we've been presented with. We think you'd be a great asset. And they jumped on board with the, the conversation and with the process and the professional development, which gave us that platform when we then had to bring it to all teachers we had some of their colleagues. It wasn't just top down. It wasn't just administration saying, hey, this is what we're doing and you have to do it. it th we had advocates within the, the teaching colleagues that said, we've been part of this and this is going to change how you're approaching students in the classroom. You know, that's one of the questions we often get from leaders is, how do I go about introducing this to our staff yeah. team? So you talked about the value of building a, a bit of a leadership team that could be a couple steps ahead, but can you share with, with those that are viewing or listening to this podcast, what were some intentional things that you did to bring it to staff so that it wasn't necessarily, we're just going to keep doing everything we've done previously, but without overwhelming that, you know, we're bringing on this new approach and without having staff feel like, oh my goodness, we've got one more thing on our plate now. Yeah. So we built it into some of the things that we were already doing. Mm -hmm. And then we, honestly, I think we introduced it two or three times where it was, okay, we're, here's our first introduction. 
let's get used with this to this aspect. And then it was, okay, we need to refine this and we're going to introduce this second part as well. Um, so we got to a point where our introduction or our, what we did as administrators to prepare and support teachers was we created the bins. We had everything they needed in there. We created the Google drives for them with all of the templates and the meeting dates and had a place for them to stay organized so that they weren't ending up with all of the papers or all of the saved files going, how do we use this as a process rather than a one-time meeting? How do we have everything to refer back to? How do we have everything that we need? We also added chocolates to the bin to make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> a teacher meeting is always beneficial. Yeah. That's true. Um, so we, we did have to introduce it a couple of times where we started with the, the roles and the meeting structure and the pre-meeting organizer. And then we went back to, I think the, the two biggest ones where we had to shift mindsets within our teaching staff were key issue focused conversations wow. rather than single student conversations. And let me tell you everything I know about this student, everything I've tried. Exactly. Challenges that are emerging. Right. And, and we found that when we go student focused conversation, when teachers start giving possible solutions, it turns into, no, I've tried that or no, I have. So it's mm -hmm. everyone trying to find one solution for one student versus when we go key issue focused, we're looking at the issue, we're giving five, six, seven possible solutions. And then everyone who has a student that falls into that category then says, I'm going to try this one, this one, this one. And then the conversation that's taken the same amount of time is now addressing six students instead of one student. Um, and then the second one is just that data-focused conversation, right? Yeah. Where we, Zach and I have made, been intentional last year of attending meetings with teachers, with all of our collaborative response teams so that we can help guide the conversation. But also the conversation stays key um, issue focused when the students that are brought forward are um, purposeful and come mm -hmm. from the data. It is easier to talk about the data and talk about the key issue when we're not bringing forward just the student that's taken up the majority of our time in our classroom. Well, and I do think when you talk about the introducing of the data, I think that was really intentional across the division of let's not overwhelm right off the start. Let's learn some of the structures, learn some of the processes when we come together to meet. And then how do we start building data into this? How do we then start developing a continuum of supports? Like it was really thoughtful from a divisional level to think about when is the next piece to be able to introduce, to bring the whole framework together over time. So Carmen, would you mind sharing um, what some of your thoughts were or what some of the benefits have been of engaging at this from a divisional perspective. Uh, we often have schools that are engaging, but their their division or their district is not necessarily pushing this or pushing well, is not always together. Right, right. right. Moving together and find that, you know, it becomes difficult as a single school moving. But when you think about all of the schools around Lakeland, it men were being introduced and and struggling at different points, but being there to help one another. Can you share what that's been like from a leadership colleague perspective in the division? It's given us the opportunity to just have a common language across the district. It yeah. also is then used in such a wider scope of decision-making. When we take a look at the assessments we're doing and participating in, how can this be used through collaborative response? How can this be used within our schools to improve student learning? Which we were having those conversations before, but again, they were more school-centered rather than school districts. So now it feels like we have an anchor kind of bringing us together and keeping us within a, a um, certain diameter of, of conversations and not in a negative way of we're restricted, but in a way of focused and when all of the schools are participating in the same thing, it allows us to have PD together for our teachers to then also participate with other schools because we only have one grade seven teacher. We only have one 
high school math teacher. So it gives us the opportunity when we have collaboration days across the district, we're all using the same language. We're all using the same format. We are assessing students in the same way. We are interpreting data the same way, and we're using it in a way that can help students on a, on a broader scope. Well, and I know that's been really valuable too, um, being able to come together on some of our leadership days and hear from another school of, yeah, we had a similar challenge to that. Here's one of the ways that we've moved for it. Um, like, I think just building up that capacity across the system help not only to share the successes, but challenges. And then how can we problem solve that together? So you're not feeling like this is just a light of Christ um, initiative and, and you're a little bit isolated. And when we had those PD days where we were all together, we took away some valuable information, even something as little as modifying one section on the pre-meeting organizer where we have the check-in of the tasks that teachers took away last year, where before we were feeling like teachers are saying, yep, I'm going to implement this. I'm going to trial this. This is what I'm committing to coming to the next meeting and going through the, the agenda format again. And we're like, we're missing that part of check-in. Did that work? Do you need a second suggestion? Was it successful? And uh, yes, I'm going to try it in my class now because it was super successful. So we just added that little box at the top of who was checking in on what, how did it go? And how are you moving forward? Um, that was a huge takeaway from another school, which seems so simple now. Like, yeah, we could have just cut and pasted that box ourselves, but it took another school presenting their screen and saying, this is what we did. And we were like, absolutely. I love that idea of, of just moving, you know, you're moving through the process all the time. And, uh, but that constant reflection of what's working, what's not working, how do we make those adjustments? Yeah. And even if it's small adjustments, no, but tweaks. how do we, how do we attend to those things that are getting in our way? So Carmen, what would you think? say is the biggest challenge that you have faced and how how have you gotten through that um i think the answer depends on where we are in the moment i think mm. if you asked me a month ago it would be different right where the challenge was onboarding new staff when our staff has moved forward right if they had three years to work through all of these things and now we're telling our new staff hey you got three weeks but we're going to be there with you um and then after our first round of, of meetings a couple of weeks ago, it was uh, how do we ensure we're bringing it back to the data with our new staff, with our conversations? How do we set that foundation straight and, and strong right from the beginning? That was a great answer to the question. <laughs> because it really speaks to that idea that this is a process and that that as you continue to move along, you're going to face different things, whether it's through the collaborative structures or whether it's about your continuous supports or even your data, you're going to face different questions and different situations through your journey that you need to address and attend to in that moment. So yeah, like it, it totally is about learning from the experience and then making adjustments, which is I, why it needs to be so contextual, why it needs to be built in your own school. This year, we don't have early dismissals. So how are we planning within the day? I was about to bring that yeah. up, but I know that was a challenge experience <laughs> throughout is you, that and, was a divisional structure prior that you could lean on. But when, when that shift happened, each one of the schools had to think about, okay, how do, how we, do address we address this? the yeah. embedding the time if we really see this as valuable? Absolutely. And it took some finessing within our timetable. We also added the additional layer where teachers, our collaborative response teams are having um, biweekly meetings. So every two weeks where one is collaborative response team meeting and one is team planning. So we added not just that we have to work this into the school day, but we're also doubling the amount of time that we have to cover within the school day. Yeah. But we found a way and now that we're a month and a half into it, I can't believe it's middle of October, but a month <laughs> <laughs> we can't either. <laughs> um, we're like, absolutely. The teachers are sending us message after message. They're meeting notes on, we plan this. We're planning extra assemblies. We're planning these celebrations for students. We're providing them that opportunity to have focused conversations. Mm -hmm. And they want to be intentional with their time as well. 
we are seeing we're reaping the the rewards of it. So I actually have two follow up then in relation to that, Carmen. Can you describe how you went about getting that time? I know that's a question that often comes up and mm -hmm. people want to hear different examples of how schools have done this. So as best you can, can you explain <laughs> how that that time for teachers to come off the floor and yeah. have time embedded right into their calendar? You mentioned every couple weeks. Yeah. So what we did is we have, we had the unfortunate circumstance of being a teacher short. So we had to combine classes for phys ed and, and music, which mm -hmm. actually provided us the platform to have this model work. Uh, so with our classes that are combined for music and phys ed, we have four classes that are in music and phys ed at the same time, which are our collaborative response teams. So we have our grade one twos and our grade three fours that are in music and phys ed. The vice principal and I cover for music and phys ed, and then we switch classes. And then those four teachers are available for one hour to have their meeting, their planning time. And then what we did is in our Google class calendar for our school, we let them know already from now till Christmas, when is their meeting week and when is their planning week. And they tell us at the beginning of the week, hey, we would like to have our meeting on Wednesday, the vice principal and myself, we put it in our calendars on Wednesday from this time to this time, we're covering music and phys ed for these teachers and they have their planning time or their meeting time. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. So then my second one, which is often another question that comes up, I had it yesterday from mm -hmm. a school is how did you go about onboarding new staff? You mentioned you, you have some already. staff that have three years in this work and they, it's become just ingrained of how we do things. But when somebody comes in new and you say we're having a, well, sometimes it's the acronym, we're having the CTM or whatever <laughs> the acronym is and people are looking, what what is that? So how did you go about onboarding new staff? So we took the time the first uh, few days of, of teacher days before school started to meet with our new staff and say, this is the whirlwind description of what you're going to partake in. And then we relied on our teachers that have been here for three years. We said for the first meeting, we planned it on a no school day on our IPP day. Uh, the vice principal or myself attended the first meeting with them. We were the facilitator for that meeting so that we could, again, model the opportunity. And also as facilitator, we could take the time to talk to our new teachers and saying, Hey, side note, this is what we're doing right now. Side note, this is what we're looking for. That's the importance of the pre-meeting organizer. This is how just giving some background information throughout the meeting. It also modeled to our returning teachers that this is how we support someone through this process. Which I, I imagine too was a nice reminder for staff who have for been everyone. there. Of, oh yes, I now... Like we often say, you have to hear it multiple times yeah. and you talk about that yeah. introducing in multiple steps, but then coming back and reviewing in multiple steps as well. Absolutely. And we wanted to ensure that teachers were supported with the whole process on that first day of the reminder of putting your norms up so that we can see them, displaying the meeting notes so that we can have that focused conversation as we're going, putting out, we created little cards with the facilitator name on the front and the descriptions on the back, handing out all of the tasks and the roles so that it's not taken for granted that everybody, oh, just be the timekeeper. Well, I'm not quite sure what the timekeeper does or the interrupter or the cheerleader. So we wanted to say, yep, it is a new year. Yep, you are in three years into it. But this is still the process that we're going to take part in to ensure that we don't slide back into how meetings were previously. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful, Carmen, that that you as leaders led that first and modeled that first, because mm -hmm. it it not only gives everyone that starting place of, you know, this is what what the expectation is. This is you know, how we're going to function that reminder of how it works, but it also sets kind of a precedent that that you feel this is important as leaders in the school and so important that we're going to spend some time going back over this, whether you are new into it or whether you are three years into it, doesn't matter. We need that time to be able to say, um, this is how we're moving forward and, and you 
leading that has is a really great model. Absolutely. I know Jen's going to have some uh, questions. I got lots of questions. Here in, <laughs> in a moment. I'm going to jump in with one more before you jump in, Jen. Carmen, you talked about the team planning time that's established and the collaborative response team meetings that, you know, each one has a different focus and a different purpose, but they um, support one another. Mm -hmm. We also talk about when we think about the layers of team, that school support team layer of students who need supports beyond the classroom and how do we create the space for that? Can you describe what that layer of team looks like in the school? How often you meet, who, what does it look like for you? Absolutely. So our student services team meets, we we plan to do once a week. Sometimes our schedules get a little ahead of us and, and the days get very short when we're running around, but our plan is to meet once a week. If we don't meet one week, we definitely prioritize the second week. So we're meeting at least at least once every two weeks. Right. And what we do is those are the students that we discuss. So teachers, we call them the blue form. Um, it's a, a referral form. Stu teachers will refer students to our SST team. And it is a form where it says, okay, these are the key issues that I'm seeing. These are the things I've tried. These are the conversations I've had with previous teachers. These are the conversations I've had with parents. And this is where I'm still looking for guidance. We want to make sure that teachers have kind of dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's in the way of, have I looked at things? Have I looked through different lenses? Have I reached out to all of the stakeholders for this child to have them be as successful as possible? Then they put in a, a blue form to our team and we meet and we say, okay, is this something that we can support with the tier two continuum of supports? Are we, where are we looking at tier two, tier three, tier four in order to support? Do we need to call in our OT um, specialist or our SLP? How do we want to address the concerns that the teacher is seeing within the classroom for these students? Do we need to do a referral to an outside agency, to a family doctor? Do we need to look into dyslexia or any of those items? Right. Mm -hmm. So I know Jen's going to jump in on the notion that you shared of tiers, but really quickly then, that student services team, who's involved in that, Carmen, when you're meeting weekly or bi-weekly, depending on your schedules? Again, it depends on one, the schedule, and two, it depends on the students that we plan to talk to on the ones we've had referrals for. So the, the core base of who's attending that meeting is myself as the principal, our vice principal, our classroom support teacher, and our family outreach worker, so our school counselor. We then take a look at, do we want the teacher to come in and provide insight as well? And if this is a student that we've also had kind of side conversations on, do we need our director of student learning? Do we need our SLP or OT? Uh, or do we need to have a conversation as an SST team ahead of time? And then we can loop in those services afterwards. Uh, we really try to get as much information and data about the student as we can so that, again, that meeting can be purposeful and intentional on how do we support the student. I, that's a great representation of uh, what we often talk about as that school support team being the hub. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you, you spoke to that idea of, you know, when you get that referral in, it's not an automatic movement into an intervention group, but it's rather a reflection of where is the need actually is, do we need to support the classroom teacher further in those tier two strategies, or do we need to go to the school level of support or do we need external services? So uh, really thinking about that, the <laughs> critical importance of yeah. that school support team and that decision making in terms of providing support for but, students but, and staff but that it's not a handoff no, of no, a no. teacher saying uh, uh i'm done somebody else needs to take over responsibility yeah uh, there's a I, huge amount of accountability in your processes that you have absolutely that's exactly it so carmen aside from collaborative response another thing near and dear to my heart is k-12 to schools because that's that's where I started. That's my baby. And I think there's huge opportunities in those situations. Now you've talked about the context of the K to 12 with respect to the structures and processes and the data. What about a continuum of supports across a K to 12 school? What does that look like? So we've 
refined our continuum. And like we said, it's a, a working document. We started with, we're going to have one continuum and teach, we're going to have it all on there and teachers all pick the supports that apply to them. Then we shifted into, you know what, when we're looking at literacy, we can probably have a K to five, K to six continuum and a six to 12 continuum because mm -hmm. the number of students in um, grade 10, 11, 12 that need as many supports in phonological awareness is much lower than in our, in our lower elementary. And we wanted to make sure that our continuums didn't become so big that it took too much time to, to sift through everything. We wanted to make sure that teachers had what they needed. And if it was convenient and purposeful, then they are more likely to use it and have it part of their, their meetings as a regular um, support. So we honestly listened to our teachers. And when they said, hey, can we? Let's try it. Let's see. And that's the beauty of having the bins and the drives. And yep, let's build this one here. We also have still whole staff PD and whole staff staff meetings and opportunity to collaborate and to say, maybe you should add this to your continuum because this is something we do use in grade three, four, but you seem to have a high number of students that could use it right now. And so your continuum is focused strictly on literacy at this point, or do you have separate ones? We have three. We have literacy, we have numeracy, and we have um, what we call relationship building, social, emotional. How do we increase attendance? Just the whole child, right? Sometimes some of those supports are out of our control in the way of what's happening at home, what's their background, how can we support which is also the importance of having our family outreach worker part of the process, because we do have a high number of students where many of the areas where they require support aren't within our building. Mm -hmm. And so how can we support them with what they're bringing to us? And how can we see if we can improve kind of how they're coming to us as well, right? So Carmen, we asked this question of all the leaders we bring on this show because everyone has a little bit of different insight based on their experiences. This question is brought to you by WeCollab. Designed by educators for educators, this comprehensive digital system aligns with the foundational components of collaborative response. Moving from conversation to action, WeCollab empowers classrooms, schools, and systems to provide the very best response for each and every child by informing action-based decision-making with data and evidence supporting student success. In the spirit of, if I knew then what I know now, what advice might you give yourself about implementing collaborative response? I think Curtis said it a few times at the beginning of the process where it's not aim and fire, just fire and then aim and refine after and then keep going. I am someone who's very focused on, do I have all of the dots? Do Am I presenting everything to teachers that they will need to be successful? Do I have everything there? And this was a process where, nope, we're going to chunk it. We're going to provide it. We're going to do, we're going to respond to teacher questions or concerns as we go. and absolutely jump in with both feet and and move forward and ask the questions and reach out when when you don't have the questions or when you don't land on both feet <laughs> sometimes you will stumble but that's an opportunity to say hey to another school or another district are you seeing this and how can we support it like you said i've mentioned it many times and it's one thing to say it but it can be uncomfortable as a leader to know we're starting something, but we don't necessarily see the end line quite yet. And the irony of that is there is no end line. We're always going to be refining as we go along, but it it is an uncomfortable space because it's a learning yeah, space. Sure. Um, you know, just like our students in the classroom, when really deep learning is there, there's moments of confusion. There's moments of uncertainty there can even be moments of frustration mm -hmm. but that's part of that uncomfortability of learning as particularly as an organization which yeah it, again it can be a little bit daunting when first starting out to be able to say we're starting something but I don't necessarily know I know step one two and three but 
we're going to figure out step four, five, and six as we move. But there's discomfort too in yeah. change. And, and a lot of this is about how do we do things differently than what we've always done in the past. And, and that, that idea of moving through change is always hard. <laughs> so I know, and I'm coming back to the, or if you knew then what you know now, I know that some of your other colleagues have spoken to the idea of keep to the process, even mm -hmm. when it's, we're still trying to figure it out. Can you speak to to that? Because I know that that's a, a key message for people first starting out is staying true to the process and not veering off to, okay, we'll cherry pick the parts that feel comfortable. And not just as you're starting, but that's the reason that we attended the meetings at the beginning of this year where, well, we know the norms. Nope. We're going to put up the norms. We're going to hand out the cards. We're going to do all of that because that is what keeps us it's, it's like riding a bike when you do it and you do it the same way. It's what keeps us on task. It's what keeps us um, key issue focused. And it's what gives us permission um, to, to interrupt because you're the interrupter. It's what gives us permission to do the things that sometimes we're uncomfortable with. So it's kind of, uh, well, I'm going to use collaborative response as the reason why I get to interrupt and say, this is where we need to bring the conversation back to, right? And so it it's the reason for for what we're doing. And if we don't keep the core parts, if we don't keep even the little parts, then we're not no longer on that same path. It is incredible when you start on that journey. And so many things, you know, you're so busy in the moment and moving things along, but sometimes we don't take enough time to be able to say, so, what have we done that yeah. we've done really well? Yeah, and and that. what is the what what are the levels of success that we've seen in our building? So what are the levels of success you've seen? What are the successes that you've been able to experience through this work? My most recent successes are focused on how are teachers using the collaborative planning time because it was something new and I know that when I was a teacher and part of PLC meetings and all of those things, it was, I know our administrator, this isn't field trip planning time. This is time where it needs to be focused. And so what I see coming out of our first round of collaborative team planning is phenomenal. And so just trusting them that this is a gift of time that it's in within your workday. Um, we were really toying with the idea that we were going to have to structure meetings after school hours. And so we were very forward in telling teachers, we've made this plan work. This is a gift of time where it's within your day, we're covering classes. And what we've seen coming out of those planning meetings are, it's heartwarming, it's encouraging, and it's going to drive student learning within our building. So I'm a huge success based on, on my teacher input and teacher um, effort in what they're putting in. Oh, that's beautiful. That's awesome. Um, well, Carmen, I, I'm going to ask a question. Have you had a chance to read the book? Yes, we did. Uh, I read the whole book before I started. I think it was the summer of COVID. Um, read the whole book and then came back and we did a book study with our teachers on, I think it was the first six months where we would read a chapter or two and, and come back to our staff meetings and have those conversations because we also wanted to make sure that, Hey, you have some of that background knowledge. We can't sit here and lecture it all to you when the 45 minute staff meeting that we have. So let's take the opportunity and teachers at the beginning were like, Oh, great. Another book study, but then a few chapters <laughs> in the Actually, this is what I'm taking away. This is what I'm putting in. When are we starting these meetings? How is this going to go? And so came forward with some very valuable insight and questions. Oh, that is absolutely fabulous. So for those watching and or listening, uh, Curtis and Lorna have their book, uh, Collaborative Response, The Three Foundational Components. And so I highly encourage 
based on Carmen's fabulous feedback here, that you take the opportunity to get yourself a copy. Uh, we have our JL Podcast 10 coupon code if you want to go in there and uh, get yourself a little bit of a discount. Uh, as well, we have the membership. We have a number of resources that will be linked in the podcast resources. And so, Carmen, I would just love to give you the opportunity. If you were going to tell a colleague about collaborative response, what would you tell them and why? I would tell them to take the time to jump on board, take the time to really evaluate how you want to support students. And it's about working smarter, not harder. Let's shift the way we're having conversations so that you can support students in a meaningful way with the areas that you truly want to. Um, and the days are are short when we're teaching. So let's use that time effectively and and make the biggest difference you can. Wonderful. Well, Carmen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I know we have the opportunity to engage in some further conversations with you and your school um, later in December. So really looking forward to those conversations as well. Thank you for taking time out uh, today to um, share with us your thoughts, your insights, and uh, the great job I know you're doing leading this work within your school. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for this opportunity. Ensuring success for all students is a moral imperative for all schools, but it takes a highly coordinated framework of structures and processes to maximize the collective capacity of the team. In Collaborative Response, three foundational components that transform how we respond to the needs of learners, we share an organizational mindset that involves fundamental shifts for schools and districts. Numerous school and district examples, as well as access to a large number of resources, are provided within the text and in the accompanying companion website. Join the growing number of schools using collaborative response to ensure high levels of success for students and staff, stemming from the essential belief that every child deserves a team. Thank you too for introducing me to Carmen because that was absolutely fabulous. And uh, one of the things that really hit me right from the get go was that notion of, you know, we're already doing this and, and her positivity around the idea of the introduction of collaborative response being that foundation for let's review and revisit. What are we mm -hmm. doing? How can and we do this better and more efficiently? And what is the ultimate impact we're actually having on student learning? And I really liked how she shared the idea that we didn't introduce it once. We introduced in multiple steps, but in bite-sized portions, whether it was through a book study or we're going to try a meeting and go slow. And then as we get new staff, we're going to take a step back and revisit to build upon. Like mm -hmm. I, I really love the intentionality of of how we're bringing this to our staff team so that it's not overwhelming we'll build upon mm -hmm. it but then we also intentionally want to take steps back to revisit review and use onboarding new staff as an opportunity to just further deepen our understanding you know what she used that phrase convenient and purposeful she used that phrase over a, a number of times and i just think uh, so she has an absolute goal in that purposefulness that she has true intention in what they're trying to achieve. But at the same time, the word convenient is a reflection of being aware of what staff can handle, yeah. how fast, how slow, and then how adding much tweaks and revisions when they need when they start to see gaps happening it's such a a huge characteristic of an effective leader is having that you know i know where i'm going i know where i want to get to and where i want to lead my staff but at the same time understanding the circumstances that staff are under and when is the time to move forward when's the time to push when's the time to back away intentionality and timing yeah and and the how right what resonated with me was that notion of the leadership team and how 
when they finally took it to the whole staff, that that leadership team actually had teaching colleagues on it. And so it wasn't, like she said, it wasn't a top down, thou shalt do this. It really was the, the advocates for, we've been along here for the ride and learning about this. And man, this is going to transform how we do our jobs. Mm-hmm. Well, and you heard throughout the intentionality around staff voice. And how do we involve our teachers and how can we be listening when, you know, we have this single continuum across the school, but it's getting overwhelming. And our teachers are saying, what if we broke this down so that it was more effective for us? What if there was, like she mentioned, the K to five Mm -hmm. version versus the six to 12? Um, I think listening to the staff and being able to, well, she said aim, (laughs) yeah, make aim adjustments as as they go along and again another characteristic of an effective leader right is is really thinking listening that you know effectively listening and then attending to what's happening within the building but but without losing the end yeah without losing that goal um and and jen to the when i went out to uh visit with them for their school feedback it their leadership team that they have established and yes including teachers is a a really uh impactful group that that is completely focused on how do we continue to improve how do we keep moving this forward and uh it was wonderful to see them as a leadership team actually you know engaging in conversations with other teachers and and talking about how do we get over this next hurdle or how do we refine this next process it's really powerful i think i also want to speak to the value that light of christ school and carmen as the principal of that organization weren't engaging in this work alone that divisional perspective that they took at lakeland that um, well, it was nine schools during COVID when they had an online school as a separate entity, and now back to eight schools. But those eight schools were all walking alongside one another with intentional system level direction and support coming in. So there was never that feeling of Light of Christ School is an island. Mm-hmm. It's how can I learn from colleagues? And it's been remarkable over those three years that she's talked about that what they're trying to do in their schools is building high levels of vulnerability and collaboration and trust that was happening at the leadership level as well when schools could come together and say we haven't figured this out yet in our school and another school could say you know we have some insights that might be able to help Mm -hmm. with that challenge because we experienced it as well here's something that we've done that that has helped I think that's really been important Mm -hmm. for their each of their schools including light of christ in their move forward and i think that hits on the note that she said of the way that this has been implemented at the district level and at the school level has given people permission to do things that they might have been uncomfortable doing before right Mm -hmm. so as a school leader i might have been uncomfortable saying i don't quite have this figured out yet but a safe space has been created and provided for them. You know, as a as a staff member around a table, I might have been uncomfortable redirecting a conversation that had gone off the rails. But no, that's my job here as the timekeeper to say, we've only got two minutes left. Can we shift back and try and find a solution? So the the framework and the the purposeful implementation of it at the various levels provides that psychological safety for people to to grow and to build further efficacy and learn from one another. Absolutely. All right, so we've reached that point, Jen, where we always turn to you to summarize. uh, What are our key takeaways that we can pull from this conversation for our viewers and listeners? So I'm going to start with Ready, Fire, Aim. She mentioned that a number of times, and we keep coming back to that. So don't wait till it's all perfect to implement it get started and use the feedback that you're gathering along the way from your staff as you're implementing and from your colleagues at the district level to help to continue to move that process forward. 
Um, the second part really is about the, the purposefulness and the intentionality of the implementation. So follow the structure, follow the processes, because they are going to be what gives you the strength in the framework to continue moving forward. That notion of advocacy for the process so that it's not a top down. And so in this particular situation, Curtis, you talked about the, the district level, like the district is advocating through the use of the the school leadership teams coming together. The school right. is advocating through the use of their teacher leadership team coming together. So that that notion that we have people who are excited and have the opportunity to have learned. And then, I mean, I could go into all the various resources and ideas and whatnot, but I think those are the three big ones, unless there's anything I missed. Nope, that was a great summary. <laughs> I think great summary. And again, uh, really wonderful to be able to have that chance to tap into Carmen, her experiences and the impact that collaborative response is having, not just for her students, but I think it was really interesting how the greatest successes with your question that you had asked, Lorna, really revolved around the impact and efforts of the staff team and what we're what we're seeing through that, which uh, again is a great lead indicator that we're going to see successes for students. Well, and her excitement that you know was clear her excitement about the things that are coming that teachers are doing through this work and just really seeing teachers uh just sharing ideas and growing and expanding and uh and how excited she was for that again to it see comes that in back that to building. that idea of how you create a culture of collaborative yeah. response absolutely not just we have some meetings that we've been told need to be aligned in this way it's it's the utilization of the components and key elements of collaborative response that just impacts the entire culture and the way that we go about collaboratively responding. As always, I'm the beneficiary of you bringing forth partners that you've worked with. And I get to, to revel in the fact that the work that you started, grassroots work decades ago, and the growth of it and the excitement that it still brings to people when they they see those aha moments and they have those, those epiphanies of, oh, it's a little tweak here, but it, it makes such a big difference, right? That shift from one student conversations to, you know, key issue conversations where we can impact all kinds of students. So thank you both for continuing to bring collaborative response to the forefront for people, because it really is changing the things that are happening for students in classrooms. Well, thanks so much, Jen. And to all of our viewers and listeners, we hope you were able to take uh, some key learnings away for yourselves as well from this conversation. We wish everyone the best. Take care and see you soon. For more on collaborative response, visit jigsawlearning.ca or join the JL Insider to receive access to newly added resources and content. Make sure to follow us on social media, subscribe to the podcast and the Jigsaw Learning YouTube channel to access past and upcoming episodes. Join us again for more conversations about establishing, refining, and deepening collaborative response.